Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 200 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. Who invented the cyclotron and therefore is dubbed the father of nuclear medicine? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to join us for our full MD Expo conference, which will bring HTM professionals from across the nation to Seattle from October the 5th to 7th for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. Details can be found at mdexposhow.com forward slash Seattle. Okay, let's see who the winner of our webinar Wednesday lunch bag is and congratulations to, oh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Stanley Zrowski. Congratulations, Stanley. The correct answer is Ernest Orlando Lawrence. Webinar, Webinar Wednesday would like to thank uh, sponsor Universal Medical. Univer Universal Medical has nurtured a business philosophy founded on offering comprehensive nuclear medicine equipment services at a reduced price. Universal Medical's products and services include new and reconditioned nuclear imaging systems, quality parts, excellent equipment service, training courses for healthcare technology managers, camera system moves, technical and clinical support, flexible financing options, and more. Visit uni-med.com for more information. If you have any problems with our audio or video today, uh, please do email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com and we will obviously send you Universal, Me Universal Medical YouTube link so that you don't miss out on a great webinar. Our presenters today are Jason Kitchell, Senior VP and Chief Operation, Operating Officer, Chad Watson, Evaluation Program Director, Craig Diener, Senior Product Manager, Craig Snowgrass, National Service Manager, and Kevin Boro, Production Manager, Quality Manager. Okay, guys, I am going to start the video for you so you will see. Thank you, Linda. Today we're outside St. Louis, Missouri at Universal Medical. For more than two decades, Universal Medical has provided new and reconditioned nuclear imaging systems, high-quality parts, expert service and maintenance programs, technical support, as well as training courses. The process of reconditioning a nuclear spec camera is complex and requires years of experience and practical knowledge. With more hospitals and clinics relying upon older equipment, it's important to understand what differentiates used versus reconditioned quality and how that difference can impact system uptime, reduce throughput, increase operational cost, which ultimately could impact your institution's financial health. With us today is Jason Kitchell, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Universal Medical. Let me start right off by asking, why would institutions even consider a reconditioned system? It's a good question, Ryan. Um, probably the best way to answer that would be cost savings. Whenever you're looking at saving upwards of 60% from what the OEM's going to want for a new camera, you can see that going with a reconditioned system can save you a lot of money. We understand that there are facilities that require new, new cameras. And at Universal, that's why we also offer new. But in the case where you don't have to have new, then reconditioning would definitely save you a lot of money. Not to mention that reimbursement isn't different for reconditioned, new, or used cameras. So my take is reconditioning is more of a better way to go than buying new. Jason, is there a difference in purchasing new versus reconditioned equipment? Other than the price savings you're going to get from buying a reconditioned compared to new, there's not a big difference other than the fact that the service. Typically when you buy a new system and the warranty expires, typically after a year, sometimes it's longer, but after that your cost for service is going to be pretty substantial. When you buy a reconditioned system, you're going to get the same service as what you would on new and you're going to save a lot of money on your service contract per year. Um, and you're going to get the same service. One thing about reconditioning companies is that they have good parts and they have good processes to repair the parts and they have the parts in stock there really is no difference so consider this if you bought a reconditioned system from someone else and that camera broke and went down and was not 
be able to scan patients. Um, what would happen if that facility did not have a part in stock? Would you be down longer than anticipated? Of course you would. So I definitely recommend whatever company you decide to go with on reconditioning, that they have good service, they have good parts in stock, ready to repair their system quickly. Thank you, Jason. Let's bring it over to Craig Diener. Craig, you're the senior product manager here at Universal. Based on your years of experience, help us define the difference between used and reconditioned. Okay, in my years in the industry, I've seen the full spectrum of used equipment all the way up to reconditioned equipment. A reconditioned piece of equipment is brought to a factory where a thorough assessment of the camera is performed. It's put through a process to make it look and perform like new according to the original manufacturer's specifications. Not everyone can do this. It takes proper facilities, equipment, resources, and technical knowledge to produce a quality reconditioned system. It should also include installation, applications training, and a warranty, as well as service after the sale is also an important factor. Whereas on a used piece of equipment, the system is usually just shipped from a warehouse or perhaps even a hospital directly to a site and it's made to function during the installation process. It may or may not include a warranty. That's a pretty stark comparison, Craig. So that's really quantified the difference in cost between used and reconditioned. A reconditioned system is usually 40 to 60 percent of the price of a new system. And this varies depending on age, demand for the product, and whether it's still being produced by the OEM. Whereas a used piece of equipment is much cheaper, almost too good to be true. So why not buy the cheaper of the two systems? Well, let's take the example of buying a used car. Dealer A has a large lot where they offer certified pre-owned cars with a large facility and several service bays where they do a 100 point inspection before placing it on the lot and they offer a warranty. Whereas dealer B, smaller operation, they offer pre-owned cars as well, a small lot with a small building, but no warranty. So which of the two would you buy? Probably depends on what you need. If you need a reliable vehicle to get you to work every day, then you're probably more inclined to pay a little extra for the certified pre-owned car. Just knowing that you have the reliability and that dealer A has your back if something should go wrong. The same is true for medical equipment. You need to have the comfort of knowing that your provider will be there from the day you place the order till the day you retire the system. Would the reimbursement of studies factor into this, Craig? Are there different rates for new, used, and reconditioned systems? Reimbursement rates are the same whether you have new, used, or reconditioned piece of equipment. Reimbursement rates are actually based on the types of studies you do and not so much the type of equipment you do it on. It's similar to Uber. You may have a driver who has a Cadillac Escalade or you might have a driver who has a Toyota Prius. In either case, you'll pay the same rate and the driver makes the same amount of money no matter which vehicle he drives. That's an interesting analogy, Craig. Is there a distinction between the long-term reliability and expected performance of a used or reconditioned system? This is what separates used from reconditioned systems. As I mentioned, you may pay more for a reconditioned system, but over the life of the product, the cost of ownership is probably less than that of the used system. Like the pre-owned car example, a reconditioned system will go through a thorough process of quality checks to ensure quality imaging when it's delivered. However, like a used car, with a used piece of equipment, you don't know what you're getting or how long it'll last. So when buying a camera, some important factors to keep in mind are your patient volume, the types of studies that you'll perform, and overall cost of ownership. It's good to consult with someone who's knowledgeable on the subject to make sure that you purchase the right system for your practice. Craig, one of the reasons that drive people to look at purchasing new versus used versus reconditioned is they've gotten an end-of-life notice from an OEM. What should people really do when they get that? Is it time to panic? No, actually, end-of-life is uh, declared by the OEM, usually 10 years after the last production year. This doesn't mean it's time to panic, that you're not going to get service, you're not going to get parts for your camera. There are many third-party companies out there that provide service and certified parts for legacy products like yours. Just keep in mind though, at some point, your camera will reach its end of useful life. So when that time comes, be proactive and plan well in advance. Jason, at the beginning of this event, and with Craig just now, you know, there's a consultative side to this. 
When you have the kind of requests that come in, people are looking for a particular OEM model, whether they have gotten an end-of-life notice or they're just really looking for something different. How do you go about finding this camera if you don't have it in this facility? Well, Ryan, as you can imagine, there are several OEMs and there are several models that the OEMs produce. So it's very difficult to actually have every piece of equipment here in our warehouse. But we can always go looking for the more popular units and we can purchase those units. Different ways of doing it are through the OEMs. The OEMs, whenever they have a trade-in of the equipment for their new piece of equipment, um, will have the ability to actually bid on the unit. And then once we win the bid, we will go out and deinstall the system and bring it back here for reconditioning. Um, so that's one way is through the OEMs. The other way is there are several medical brokers out there that have the equipment for sale and they have the relationship with the end user, the hospital, the clinic, whatever it might be. And we can go and bid the unit from them and again do the same thing as we would with the OEM. The third way that we could do it is through our website. Um, we have relationships with many customers that you know, they're looking at maybe replacing their unit, they may be replacing it for new, they may be replacing it for a reconditioned system from us. And we'll take it in a trade-in or we'll go in and purchase the unit directly from the hospital. So I'd say the three different ways are through the OEM, through the medical brokers, and again, through the actual end user themselves. What we really have here, and I think Jason and Craig, you really set this up, are two tracks. There's the track of the customer who made a request, and then you've got an internal process that's reconditioning. And what we're going to talk about with our STEAM panel um, here is, is that process. So with that, let's start with Chad Watson. Uh, Chad's National Parts Manager uh, for Universal Medical. You know, Chad, as I understand it, one of your roles is helping customers uh, with sorting out the process and understanding what their site can handle. You know, if you could, you know, talk about the process you go through, how you help them understand how to select their camera and how that might work. You know, so what is the process of having their site surveyed for a customer? So one of the first things that should happen when purchasing a system is a site survey. First of all, we're going to determine what system you need and what fits your needs. For instance, are you doing cardiac only studies or are you doing more general nuclear studies? From there, we're going to look at your room size and, and what we can put in that room. And once that's determined, we're going to go to the room setup. So from there, we'll determine where the camera is going to be positioned, where your processing system will be located. We'll look at the electrical requirements, the, the network drops, where your hot lab should be positioned so it doesn't interfere with imaging. And then we'll move on to looking at the route to get into the room. Is any construction going to be necessary? Do hallways and doorways need to be removed or relocated to get the system into the room? We'll look at your loading dock and see if we need to have a truck with a lift gate or if there's any special equipment needed, a fork truck or anything like that. We'll look at what floor you're on. Is there an elevator involved? What are the dimensions and weight capacities of that elevator? And we'll look at what's in your room. Are we able to get that stuff out and out of the way? So skipping a site survey is going to leave a lot of unanswered questions and certainly delay your installation process and be quite costly. So a reputable company will work through all these obstacles in the beginning and ensure a smooth process from start to finish. We're going to talk a lot today about Universal's reconditioning process and how that applies to you all out there who are interested in buying a reconditioned system. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this and hopefully helps you visualize what we're going to talk about today. After being carefully selected, systems undergo a meticulous process to affirm they meet OEM and our own exacting standards. All systems are staged in a dedicated test bay where they are inspected and scope of work is determined. Systems are carefully disassembled, cleaned, and disinfected in a static-free zone, protecting them from electrostatic discharge and blood-borne pathogens. Once surfaces are free of contaminants and properly prepared, systems are painted and detailed to present in like-new condition. Photomultiplier tubes are inspected and reinstalled with new optical coupling. Crystals are inspected and replaced as required to meet OEM specifications. If applicable, light guides are recoupled. Detectors are carefully reassembled and tested for component failure. After a thorough acclimation period, detectors are calibrated to meet original specifications in accordance with OEM test procedures. New energy, linearity, and uniformity correction tables are acquired and stored. Motion drives, cables, and main gantry are inspected and replaced as necessary, 
Lubricants are cleaned from the entire system and reapplied in accordance with original manufacturer's specifications, an extra step that ensures smooth operation. Mechanical parts, such as Acme screws, radius bearings, ball joints, gears, and chains are inspected and replaced as needed. Diagnostics are performed on the computers. Operating systems and optional software are installed. Computers are integrated and tested with each camera as a complete system. Gantry and drive systems are calibrated and center of rotation tests are performed and verified. Motions are checked for smooth clinical operation according to the original manufacturer's specifications. Based upon customer requirements, the system and peripherals are tested as a complete operating system. System quality assurance consists of image quality, uniformity, and resolution inspection. Internal and external cosmetics are thoroughly inspected. Each system is assessed by our certified clinical support specialists who make certain that the system meets OEM clinical operation standards as well as our own exacting standards. Each system and its individual components are packaged with extreme care, which are then carefully transported by our logistics team to ensure it arrives at your facility in the same condition it left our factory. Prior to delivery, our team conducts professional site planning performs installation in accordance with OEM guidelines, and afterwards, we often provide applications training that meets or exceeds your requirements. A reconditioned nuclear imaging device isn't declared universal certified until we're 100% satisfied that the system is ready to give you years of trouble-free operation. Kevin Bohr, Production and Quality Manager for Universal Medical. While Chad and his team are going through that process, uh, you're bringing in the camera that has been sourced. You know, can you go into more detail on the inspection process and what that entails? And I think everyone here listening today would be interested, you know, what are the top three things that you inspect? We take the care and time to inspect all aspects of the system. The top three things that we inspect are the crystals, the mechanical assemblies, as well as the cosmetics of the system. Our engineers have completely disassembled systems and have an advantage in that they've seen things that the seasoned field engineers haven't. We want to ensure that the systems that we choose for the reconditioning process will provide the best quality products for our customers and their patients. Kevin, what does this initial inspection and the subsequent process really prevent for them down the road? What is the long-term benefit? The long-term benefit for the customer is they can feel confident in the system that they've purchased. Their doctors or physicians can accurately diagnose a patient, whether it's a clean bill of health or if there's medical attention needed. What we're really preventing is a misdiagnosis of a patient with a quality reconditioned system. What if the system doesn't meet your standards? If a system we inspect doesn't meet our standards, we'll part out or scrap the system. We may keep some of the assemblies and use them at a later date for another project, and we work with many recycling organizations to recycle all of the portions that we discard. Why do you do all this sorting? What is the reason for doing this? We want to be good stewards to the environment. We want to ensure that we sort out the aluminum, the lead, the steel, and recycle that appropriately. We don't want our items ending up in landfills. Kevin, one of the things you mentioned in the top three sections was that you inspect the crystals. Let's use that as an example. Tell us specifically what you look for during an inspection. Well, a new crystal will be pure white. An old crystal or a bad crystal may be yellowed, and that's caused by the seal of the crystal allowing air and moisture in. Over time, this yellowing will increase and degrade the images further. Detector corrections can hide a yellowed crystal, but a quality reconditioned system with a new crystal, there's nothing being hidden underneath. Tell us a little bit more about the mechanical repairs and replacements. So the systems we receive have been in the field for a long time. The mechanical assemblies may not have the right grease applied. They may not have the right amount of grease applied. Systems that we receive should have the assemblies taken apart, the bearings and gears replaced as needed, the correct grease applied, and the correct amount of grease applied to those assemblies. Kevin, what might be some of the consequences of poor mechanical movements? Systems that have poor mechanical movements could cause an acquisition to stop or a patient to need to be rescanned. Could cause the center rotation correction to be incorrect, causing images to have artifacts in them. And the worst possible consequence could be harm to a patient. So in addition to proper imaging um, and 
you know, system uptime. There is also the impression from the patient. I just recently had an x-ray done at a clinic and I noticed that it was a pretty beat up system and, and frankly it didn't give me the best feeling about the procedure or the clinic. You know, how do you deal with the cosmetics? Systems we receive may have panels that are cracked, dented, scratched, or possibly unrepairable. Having a person in your facility that can make these repairs as well as paint is a plus. You could paint over a bad repair and it would look worse than doing nothing at all. Kevin, what care do you take in addition to the painting to make sure this looks better than new? After a system has been through the cosmetic portion of the reconditioning process, it should look as good, if not better, than when it came new from the OEM. OEMs get their components from different states as well as different countries around the world. The color and paint shade may not match. We have an advantage in that we have the entire system in our facility and can paint it at once, ensuring a color match throughout the entire system. Chad and Craig, you know, Kevin really brought us through a detailed process of inspection and repairs, you know, all the way down to the aesthetics, and we haven't even talked about computers yet. So how do these fit into the reconditioning process? Acquisition and processing computers are going to follow the same reconditioning process as the rest of the system. They're going to be brought in, tested, assessed, and parts replaced as needed. Things like cooling fans, monitors, and keyboards should be replaced with new as a standard. Panels are going to be removed, painted, and then reassembled and should get a new cosmetic appearance when finished. Maybe the most important thing with the computers is the hard drives. They can contain site information as well as patient information, and that needs to be removed. So you need to wipe the, the drive clean, reformat it, and load the, the system from scratch, and this will ensure HIPAA compliance. Also, besides loading the computer with the original base software, licensed software like Cardiac Software, for example, should be relicensed by the vendor to ensure compliance and usage by the customer. And in addition to reconditioned workstations, a new workstation can be provided with vendor neutral type cameras, reconditioned cameras, and in some cases it can be provided as an add-on. This provides the customer a new path to newer versions of general and cardiac processing programs such as halftime imaging. So now we're going to bring in Nick Iwana. Nick is the uh, Vice President of Corporate Quality and Customer Support Services and Clinical Support Specialist. Nick, the next step in this process is quality assurance. Can you give us an overview? What happens during this process? Quality assurance actually encompasses the whole process of reconditioning a, a system. Uh, it's a program. Uh, this piece, well, I'll get to your question in just a moment, but for this, this stage, but the quality assurance program should be and is part of a quality management system and that's what it should be. And this is a comprehensive system that actually during this whole process uh, of what we've talked about today or much of what has been talked about today is probably covered in as a quality assurance or qual part of a quality management system. Your question, in this stage or this piece of the reconditioning process, this is a vital stage because the actual system, the quality of the system is assessed, completely assessed as it would function in a clinical setting. Part of that whole process is everything, evalu evaluating everything from the actual cosmetic appearance all the way through how it performs mechanically and functionally in clinical procedures. Little pieces of this, a few of these, but uh, part of what is covered in this or what is assessed during this whole process includes, but is not limited to, Again, assessing for a cosmetic appearance. Does it look how it should? Does it look like new, a new system? Uh, will we look over the monitors. Um, do the monitors meet resolution patterns? There's res resolution criteria and standards that it has to meet. A lot of this is now part of the joint commission uh, for the resolution. We test these monitors. We also test all the software for the functionality. Does the acquisition software and the processing software on the workstations actually perform functionally and how they should perform in that clinical setting. I or whoever is doing the assessment will actually perform or should perform clinical procedures, simulated clinical procedures. Uh, all the mechanicals, is, is it a spec study it should be performed? Uh, check to see if the gate is working so that if they're doing a gated study that that gate is actually working through the acquisition in order to create the image. If it's a total body system, 
The mechanicals of creating a total body scan should be, should be performed. Uh, we also check, uh, not only that, we check all of the workstations to make sure that they're HIPAA compliant. Make sure there's no patient data on there. Um, the double check the system um, for the panels. Uh, everything is checked, the software all the way from top to bottom. This part in this whole clinical assessment is the final stage before that system is carefully disassembled, packed up, inventoried, before it now then goes to be delivered to the customer. Chad, we talked about these parallel tracks of the equipment going through the reconditioning process and the customer going through the purchasing process. What do you suggest a customer should do to properly vet their supplier? Yeah, one of the things that customers should do when purchasing the system is visit the facility that they're purchasing it from. Take a tour of that facility, look around, check out, see how things are organized and how they do business on a daily basis. Their technicians should be knowledgeable of the processes that they are doing to recondition their systems. So ask them questions and they should be able to answer those questions. They should have a checklist and a process that they follow. So look at those checklists and make sure that they're doing the things that they say they are doing. Visit their shipping department and see how things are going to be packaged and delivered to you. Nick just talked about their quality assurance. They should be knowledgeable both about that as well. So check their records and see what they have, not just for the equipment that you're purchasing, but for their quality system as a whole. See what goals they have and how they meet those goals. And you should walk away from that site visit with the confidence knowing that you picked the right company to do business with. Kevin, now we've gone through all these steps, it's time to ship it out. Can you go into more detail about how the delivery process should work? So delivery of your system is a very important part of the entire reconditioning process. Your system should be packaged safely and correctly, should be loaded on a truck, should be transported to your facility in a safe and controlled manner. We use our own logistics technicians driving our own trucks to deliver systems to our customers. We don't subcontract delivery of our systems. We also have a mechanical team to bolt the system to the floor, align all the components, and get it ready for our experienced engineer to complete the installation and help train the staff in the use of that system. So now the customer has their system delivered and installed, Nick. What about the applications? Clinical applications, the process actually be begins before clinical applications. Prior to actually being on site for clinical applications, what we do, or what I would encourage one to do, is we actually have a conversation and communications between the installation team, the clinical application specialist, and the customer. This helps to coordinate the schedules so that it's a seamless installation. Once the actual system is then is installed, what we encourage to occur is to actually on the first day of applications is to retain the lead installation engineer. So that engineer stays on site. And during that first day of clinical applications, it's, it's essentially a post-installation quality assessment to make sure that that system is performing clinically as it should in a clinical setting. If there's any little changes that have to be made, it's fine-tuned at that point. During that, during that whole process, then that engineer is there and, then, and it helps out this whole process to make sure that system functions as it should. The actual clinical applications process is a comprehensive program. It should be a learning experience for their technologists. We're not only teaching them how to use the system, but why do we use it? Why do we use it a certain way? Why do we set up acquisition protocols a certain way? Or why do we process a certain way? And all this helps them to refresh them, the clinical aspect of the nuclear medicine, so they can actually utilize that system better clinically to get final outcomes for the physician. And speaking of the physicians, it's encouraged to meet with a physician. Have the physician sit down and, and look at what you are creating for their processing defaults, their displays. Do the displays and do the quantitative and the qualitative results meet with what their expectations so that they can actually make the diagnosis that they need. Finally, during this whole process, um, after it's completed, um, once they complete, a, a, the successfully complete this process, the technologist then receives credits that have been approved by the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today talking about quality assurance and some of the other 
more intricate parts of this process. Thank you again. Thank you, Ryan. Lastly, let's bring in Craig Snodgrass, National Service Manager. Craig, we've, we've talked about everything about the reconditioning process. We've talked about training and the camera's installed. Nick has got them up to speed and they're, they're getting their credits. How does service and warranties generally work with a reconditioned system? Any different than a new one? You know, what's their expectation? No, service and warranties should be the same for both reconditioned and new systems. There's generally a one year warranty period with the sale of a new system. After that warranty period, most reliable service companies will offer you multiple choices for service. Here at Universal, we offer four. We have full service contracts, we have PM only contracts, we have PM plus contracts, and we also do time and material service. The performance and the uptime of your system are generally the two main things you want to worry about when it comes to service. Uh, to get the best out of both of those, it's good to choose a reliable service company whose FSC is not only trained with your exact piece of equipment, again, whether that's new or used, but also has a very good parts inventory to back them up. Craig, I'm starting to sense a theme here. If you have a technician going to a customer site for an inspection, um, you know, they should know what they're doing. Um, do you have technicians here or any folks throughout the country? Yes, we currently have several FSEs look located throughout the continental 48 states and we are offering service in Alaska at this time. All of our engineers are OEM trained and have several years of experience. As a matter of fact, recently I ran some numbers just to see how much experience we had and of our engineers we average over 20 years of experience per FSE. I'm willing to bet that that's one of the most experienced FSE teams in the country. How does the customer benefit from the FSE's experience? With an experienced FSE, they're able to call the customer once the call comes in to call that customer back and diagnose over the phone in their own words of what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what they're not hearing or seeing, and sometimes can have the parts already on site before they arrive so that when they get there, they can resolve the issue and have the camera up and going in less time. So I want to thank all of you today for that really great information. I'm sure the audience appreciates it. Jason, maybe I can turn to you now and ask you maybe to give us a quick summary. You know, Universal is one provider and there are others out there in the marketplace, but we want you to try to help folks understand why we're here and what we're trying to convey and, and maybe you know, what it is and why you do what you do. Well, sure. You know, thanks guys for helping out with this webinar. Um, I'm hoping that it's been helpful to you as well. There's many things that can be taken away from this, but the main thing to look at is that it doesn't matter if it's new, if it's new, reconditioned or used camera that you're looking at buying, but check out the facility that you're buying it from. You're getting ready to spend quite a bit of money you want to make sure that when that system shows up to your site, that it works well and it's not a lemon and you have more downtime than uptime. There are many aspects that need to be looked at when you're buying a system. Um, not only the quality of the system, but also the services and whether or not that service company can provide the parts that are needed to repair the system if it does go down. Many times, a piece of equipment unfortunately is going to go down, just like any electronics you have. In fact, you may have had this happen before. Maybe you have a refrigerator or an appliance at home that's broke. And a lot of times it may be some electronic piece that breaks. It's inevitable that electronics are going to break. So I think it's important that whenever you buy a reconditioned system or a new system, that the parts are available, the service is available, they get you up and running as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Jason. Linda, it's back to you for the Q&A. Thank you guys. Um, I've had quite a few questions come in. Um, the first question is, if I am on a short schedule, how long does it take to source a camera? Sure, Linda, I can handle that. That's Jason here. And, um, you know, as I mentioned in the webinar just now, that talked about the fact that it's difficult to have every piece of equipment available that's out there. Uh, but in most cases, when we do don't have the system in stock, um, we can go looking for it. Uh, the more popular units out there, it normally takes us about 30 days to find it. Um, the harder to find cameras, it may take us up to 60 days. But uh, most times, like you said, we try to have the stuff in stock, but if we can't, it's, it can be 30 to 60 days to find the unit. Okay, great. So, so how long does the reconditioning process take? Well, again, that's going to kind of depend on the system because each system is a little bit different. But uh, typically, a reconditioning process is going to take 30 to 45 days to complete it properly. Um, so, you know, by the time we find the, if we don't have the product in stock um, and we do find it after the 30, 60 days, another 45 days to go through the reconditioning process, 
uh, we can actually have it on site for you and ready to uh, start scanning patients. So, uh, how do you qualify the customer based on what their clinical needs are? Greg, you want to take that one? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, well, many customers have an idea of what they're looking for when they do call on us, but for the customers who are not sure what they need, we certainly do try to consult with them and give them a good path to go. Uh, we begin with consulting with them, advising them based on a few factors like the referring physician base, the catchment area, patient demographics. We also take into consideration you know, their future needs, how the patient population may change over time, and your geographic location, if it's growing or not. All these factors go into which camera you need, whether it's, and whether a reconditioned camera is right for, the, for that site. Okay, so when during the camera purchasing process should I do a site survey? Well, the site survey should be done in the very beginning. Um, this is what's going to determine what kind of system you need and the needs of your facility. Uh, you're going to look at the physical dimensions of the room, as we, as we mentioned, and all your networking and infrastructure. And that needs to be determined well in advance of uh, anybody showing up with a piece of equipment. I know that there was, uh, we had a, a, an instance where a company did their own prep work and their own site work and ordered the camera and we showed up with that camera and it wouldn't fit in the room. We, would, we couldn't even get it to the room. It wouldn't fit through their doorways and hallways. And they had to wind up doing some construction to be able to get the camera installed. And of course that set them back and a lot of money was spent, and all of that could have been avoided uh, if we'd have just done the site survey in the beginning and known what we were walking into when we got there. Okay, so, so how long does it take to do a site survey? Site surveys are going to depend on uh, several factors. Uh, one of them is the size of the facility. You know, a larger facility, you're going to have a longer route to get to the room typically from the loading dock to the room is going to be a lot of hallways and doorways. So a lot of different measurements to take uh, and consider a, a smaller facility, maybe just right around the corner where you can just get right from the loading dock to the room. Um, the number of people involved goes up at larger facilities. You normally have multiple departments involved, the radiology department, maybe uh, the clinical engineers. IT department, so there's a lot of people to talk to and get things figured out with. Um, so larger facility could easily be about three or four hours on site, and maybe the smaller facility is one to two hours. And that's just the on-site time uh, to get all the measurements and, and do all the planning. And then, of course, when you get back with all that information, there's a lot more planning that goes into that. But on-site time is typically three to four hours. Okay. So what process do I go through selecting a camera for my facility? This is Craig Diener again. Um, you know, selecting a specific camera just depends on your clinical needs and your patient demographics. One of the things, as I mentioned during the webinar, was patient volume. And uh, it's important to understand that if you're only doing two patients a day, it may not make sense to buy a spec CT camera for hundreds of thousands of dollars. On the other end, there's uh, customers who do say 20 patients a day. And here again, it doesn't make sense to buy a single head camera if you're doing that much volume. So those are the kinds of things we look at. Another thing is we look at the types of studies, you know, if, it's a, if they're gonna do general, um, general nuclear medicine, if they're gonna do cardiac work, or if it's strictly gonna be an overflow camera. You may not need to spend as near as much money for an overflow camera. So those are things to keep in mind. The other thing that's probably more important is if the customer is used to a certain type of camera and a certain type of workstation, they may be accustomed to, uh, without mentioning any names, but they may be accustomed to one that they've been using for the last 20 years or so. And, uh, and if that's the case, if they're especially partial to it or if they're specifically biased to a certain brand, we try to help them fit into a similar camera to that. Nick, doesn't it also make it easier for them to be able to be trained on that unit if they've already been using that particular model for a while, or at least a processing station for a while? That does impact the, uh, the actual, uh, this is Nick, uh, that does impact the actual amount of time and, and what needs to go into in the training process. Okay. Okay, 
Okay. So what if the camera doesn't fit? Uh, this is Chad again. And if your camera doesn't fit, you do have options. Uh, one obvious is, that is to do some construction. So if you have a, uh, no other rooms are available or no other places in the department are available, maybe you can knock down a wall or, or extend the room in that way to where you can get the camera to fit. Um, another way is just to choose another system with a smaller footprint. So uh, if that's not an option, if you really had your mindset on the, on the camera that you want and that's what you're going for, you may have to find other ways to get around it. Um, one way is to keep the processing station in another part of the department, not in the room with the, with the equipment. Um, it can be networked. So that can give you some more space in the room that the camera's in. Same for the hot lab. If that's in the room where the camera resides, it can be moved to a different part of the department. And that may even actually help with imaging and, and keeping out of the way of that. Um, what about collimators? Collimators can be stored at different locations. A lot of those have carts and stuff that take up a lot of room. And all of that stuff can be put in an adjacent room because if they're not used that often. Um, other things to look at, you may have a sink or cabinets and stuff like that in your room, and those can be removed just to get that room a little bit larger and put in a, a different part of the department. Okay, now, if I, if I buy a reconditioned camera, should I expect more or less service? This is Craig Snodgrass. Um, as we discussed in the video, it, it basically comes down to if you're buying the used versus the, the pre-owned comparison. Um, like we talked about with a used car, it's generally sold as is. Um, there's probably not a warranty. It's unlikely that it was ever gone through, you know, and had, had anything serviced before that, that resell of the piece of equipment. Um, and then with your, with your, uh, your certified pre-owned, you know, things usually have a multi-point inspection. Uh, things are gone through, your typical wear parts are replaced or at least inspected to make sure that they are in, in good shape. Um, that usually costs more, um, usually a little more time to get them to where you want to purchase them. So there may be some, a little more time involved there. Um, but for the reconditioned cameras, um, you should really only expect your normal preventative maintenance and your normal service schedule. Uh, there should be few su surprises because again, it's been through an inspection, uh, the motors, uh, bearings, pulleys, anything that normally wear out, even fans have all been re replaced, gone through. And, and should be in there to last a long time, just as if it was a brand new piece of equipment. Okay, now going off slightly, how long does clinical apps training take? This is Nick uh, answering that question. Uh, we, if you, if we step back a moment and, and some of the, um, throughout the, the actual webinar itself, and, and really referencing back to what um, Craig Diener talked about earlier on qualifying the customer and, and what their clinical needs are. And that's probably the, the first step and the preliminary piece of all this is in qualifying the clinical needs of the customer prior to the actual purchase. And in qualifying those needs is, is again, and it was brought up just briefly on what is the what is the uh, the customers or the technologists and the physicians experience with a system or a manufacturer you know, that being software processing software operation and that's going to impact how long uh, that will take so that should be built in up front or, or at least negotiated and discussed up front so we know how much or we can at least anticipate how much the training should uh, how long that should take and that's going to vary also on the clinical, when we talk about the clinical needs, um, I, Craig Diener spoke on this also. If it is a cardiology, they're only doing nuclear cardiology. The amount of time that it's going to take to do the training, being that it's just a nuclear cardiology specific, it's going to take a lot less time because it's really involved in only a few procedures associated with um, cardiac diagnosis. However, if it is a system in a hospital system, general hospital system, where they're doing general, general nuclear medicine, they're doing a variety of procedures. They're doing procedures, um, you know, bone scans. They're doing um, gastric emptings. They're doing cardiac. All of these put together um, in order to set up proper acquisition and processing and to be able to use the systems correctly, it's going to take a, a, quite a bit of a period of time, and that can vary. 
Uh, and that's going to take a, a, quite a bit of period of time in order to do that. And so that's going to vary again, depending on what they're, what they're actually, what type of procedures they're doing, what is, how, what type of patients that they are going to be imaging, and and, and also, you know, it kind of you balance it between the actual expertise of the technologist with the system. Okay. So oh, when should I have my team undergo this training? Well, that's usually uh, that's uh, that's usually fairly specific. Um, that training generally occurs, and you want to schedule it shortly after the installation of the system. So there's a there's a there's a, a proper segue so that there's not a gap. Now, what may change that is a system may be installed based on what the schedules are, and they the site or the customer may not be actually doing performing patient studies on that for a week or two. So it depends on when the customer may want to actually image those patients, when that imaging is going to start, because it's ideal to actually perform the clinical applications or best to do the applications when there's actual patient studies so that we can not, we're not simulating studies, we're actually performing on patients. So it's a, it's a live situation. Okay. Why is it important for us to go through clinical apps training? Well, I, it's probably fairly obvious. Again, we go, if I reference back to there's there's times when clinical applications is is really not needed and may be done over the phone over the phone because of the experience of the technologists, which I mentioned earlier, with that system. They may have full um, full knowledge of the system, so that there there's very little need. Uh, but the actual importance of it is being able to, and, and if I allude, if I allude back and reference back to what I spoke with on uh, during uh, during the previously in the webinar, is is a lot of technologists, you know, will learn how to operate the system. But if we can teach them why the whys of the system, that's going to make them and teach them to be better at producing the images that are needed to make the diagnosis, for the physician to make the diagnosis. Okay, that's great. Uh, well, I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. An informative uh, webinar today. And of course, thank you again for today's sponsors, the Universal Medical. Um, one lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Now, you must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Uh, thank you all uh, again, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great day.